So I'm going to hear, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about offshoots, uh, which is our practice in Boston, approach to productive planting design, and scaling up kind of big ideas about phytoremediation using small projects. So first, uh, as Frank mentioned, I grew up on a garden center in Central Mass. My dad was a Stockbridge grad, and um, he was in Paxton, Mass. His, his garden center is still there. And this is me rolling around with my sister in a garbage can. I mean, we were basically, you know, plants from my blood growing up. But what I realized really, on, really early on, right, is, is garden design and landscapes can be so resource intensive. We all know that, right? But what was crazy in growing up with it is everyone with, a, every guy who came into the garden center with a pickup truck and a shovel called himself a landscaper, maybe didn't have a lot of, you know, kind of knowledge about what they were doing. And my dad was giving them all of the, the ideas, right? And what's so frustrating is the amount of water and fertilizer and all the plants were getting shipped out from, uh, out, out, in, out on the West Coast was just so consumptive to me. So the green industry wasn't so green. So I kind of grew up with this idea of that traditional landscape um, was this almost an aesthetic concept of trying to keep, you would install a plant and basically, you know, maybe get it, let it get a little bit bigger, but essentially treat it like sculpture, right? That it was just something you were just constantly putting inputs in. So when I went to graduate school, I created this diagram about traditional landscape was about constantly putting inputs in to almost keep it the same, right, as you were going through. And I was more interested in this idea of productive landscape, right? How could you put in inputs that would strategically change to get outputs over time that were productive? Could it be edible? Could it clean sites? Could it, you know, foster habitat? What else could these plantings do, right? So at the beginning of our practice in 2012 when we started offshoots, and I say we because another UMass grad, Joe Schaffner, started the practice with me. He started the installation side, and we have a design side. So we're kind of a little bit of a hybrid practice. We put in the middle of our business model this idea about creating a new normal to create productive, sustainable landscapes. And everything that we've designed in our business model is against it. So when we buy a new truck, we think, can we buy an electric truck? When we think, when we buy paper, we think, should we be buying recycled paper? So everything is questioned about how can we be more sustainable in our industry. And so we have design, installation, and we're considering possibly having retail at my, gar my dad's garden center if Offshoots takes it over. So um, we need a really good manager. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this out there and at the end. Again, we are looking for you. We are looking for someone really good to come to help us out. But at the center of this practice, I realized you can't innovate without research, right? And research is at the center of the practice. So with what we do, we're always doing research. And I call this a hybrid practice because we don't install all the landscapes that we design. We do a lot of traditional landscape architecture that we don't do any installation. And on the other side, we actually, in our plant, in our installation department, we only do horticulture. So we do soils, we think about water, and we think about, and we also do planting installation for other landscape architects that are interested in a real kind of different kind of horticulture and paying attention to the plant community, including the microbiology of the soil. So we're hybrid that way, um, and so it's a lot of fun. We're always experimenting. When we first started, this is Joe that's right on the right of me here, and Shelby and Mark are all still on our team. When we first started, we just had a few people, and we are up to, uh, we'll have 18 when it comes this summer, so this is a little bit of an older photo. Um, so we're located, like I said, right in Boston, um, in Charlestown. Um, so I'm going to first talk about our research in phytoremediation and how I'm going to first describe some principles about phyto and then show how it's been applied in some of our work. So the reason I got into this, right, how do you get into phytoremediation? Um, my first project that I was given right out of grad school when I started looking around for work was a gas station site down in Barnstable, Massachusetts. And we were going to turn it into a, into a park. And I said, well, can we clean it up? You know, I had heard about this technology that you might have contaminated, you know, spills, and then you could plant switchgrass, or maybe you could plant poplars and have a whole, you know, maybe monoculture of a particular thing and clean up the soil. So what I started getting excited about is how could we take those principles and use them to create prophylactic or phytobuffering plantings before the contamination happened, right? 
or even set that up so that as the um, as new uses come in, you have set up this kind of buffer zone or productive plantings that are going to bring it beyond to a next use. So what I did at that time is I went in and saw this guy, who's um, this is our class at Harvard that we we ran research seminars in phytotechnologies for three years. Neil Kirkwood, the co-author, he had been my professor when I was at the GSD in undergrad. And I said, hey, Neil, can we do anything with this gas station site? And he said, honestly, Kate, I have no idea. And I was like, what do you mean? I took your Brownfields class. You talked all about phytoremediation. And he said, um, honestly, the research is really mixed. Um, and I don't really know like, how much of it is peer reviewed. And so he said, let's start a research seminar to look into this. So stay in touch with your professors. Very important point. But I went back to him, and he said, let's start to work with some of the current students. And we ended up running these research seminars over three years, which then that information turned into this book. So I'm going to give you some of the really basic principles of Fido. Okay? So right, you all know in photosynthesis, plants take energy from the sun. right? They convert it into sugars, a lot of it that go down into the root zone. And in that, we then have um, a, uh, we have exudates that come out of the plant that are both in the form of sugars and phytochemicals, right? And there's this rich explosion of microbiology that happens in the root zone called the rhizosphere, right? We know we have at least 100 to 1,000 times more microbes in the root zone of the plant than in soil alone, right? So we have this big explosion of microbiology. And then in addition, we also know that the plant also can take up a lot of water. Oh, hold on, I think we had one, one, there it goes. Can take up a lot of water, sucks up a lot of water during photosynthesis, brings it into the plant, and evapotranspires it, transpires it into the air as part of phytosynthesis. So one of the, the statistics that I love from one of the scientists I work with during the book was that you know, trees in North America move more water than all the rivers combined in North America during the growing season, right? Because this transpiration, there's just so much water. So cooling of cities is not only because of shade, but it's also because of transpiration, right? And we're putting so much water into the air. So the real principles of Fido, the easiest way to break this down is to think about the contaminant that you might have on a site into two groups. Either it's organic contaminant or inorganic contaminant, OK? So a little kind of heavy science here, right? Organic contaminants are things that are typically a compound, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. They, are, they can be broken down into other parts, OK? So if you were going to plant a plant into a site that had an organic contaminant like petroleum, you could bring it in. And the plant and its associated microbes, mostly happening in the soil, could actually potentially break down that contaminant. No, th then the contaminant is no longer there. No reason to harvest, harvest the plant. So you're actually breaking down that contaminant into metabolites that are no longer harmful. Okay? So opposite that, very different, is inorganic contaminants. Right? These are contaminants that are things like arsenic, cadmium, zinc, they're contaminants that are on the periodic table, right? We know from basic chemistry, you cannot break these things down into different parts, OK? All we can do is move them from one place to another place, right? So what we would do in this particular case is install what we call a hyperaccumulator that would potentially be matched with a particular contaminant, inorganic contaminant, that would take in that, um, that contaminant but then you would have to come behind and harvest it and bring it to a, a landfill facility because you have to move that contaminant out. Does that make sense? Totally different. Organic and inorganic, you can break down. No longer harmful. Don't have to harvest the plant, right? Inorganic contaminants, you would have to harvest the plant to remove it from site. And for these inorganic contaminants, you have to use something called a hyperaccumulator a plant that will take up at least 100 times more of a particular contaminant than something else. These have been studied for quite a while, and there are lots of different resources out there to pull out what are the different hyperaccumulators for, for, for specific contaminants that you have on your site. The mechanism you're using in that is called phytoextraction. So it's the idea you're extracting that contaminant, and then you're actually going to harvest the plant and take it away to remove it from site. The challenge is is that it doesn't really work that well. So we all get real excited about, OK, the organic side, lots of potential. 
the inorganic side, most of the time, the contaminant is so tightly sorbed to soils. So say if you have a whole bunch of lead in the soil and you plant a hyperaccumulator plant like sunflower, okay? In a lab condition, it may take up a whole ton of lead, okay? And because it's a hyperaccumulator and you might be in a water solution. But as soon as you bring it out to the field, a lot of that lead is not bioavailable to the plant. What it means is it's locked up in the soils. It's so tightly sorbed to the soil and maybe only 10% of it is bioavailable to the plant. So we have found through the research, you can go online and find a hyperaccumulator for lead and for zinc and for cadmium, but the truth is, is in the field, the long-term field studies have not really worked, okay? There are a few outliers to that. Most of the time we want to do phytostabilization for this reason, meaning What's the best practice we do in landscape architecture? We stabilize that contaminant on site, okay? We hold it in place and take it out of harm by adding a little bit of new soil or capping it with mulch or doing raised beds, something to take it out of contact with humans. Um, there are a couple outliers, which I'll show you in a minute. So I made this graph a long time ago that was about when is there a good opportunity for phytoremediation on a site? and not so much if you have a particular contaminant. And then on the bottom, how long would it take, okay? And so this is, by the way, for contaminants in soil. Water is very different. We can pull a lot of contaminants out of water that are up here. This is when you have a contaminant in soil. Can you get it into the plant and can you mitigate it? So lots of opportunity here. Obviously, nitrogen and phosphorus, right? They're plant macronutrients. We can do a lot with that. Volatile organic compounds, TCEs and PC, like you can see here on this chart, guys, organics are the circles. This is on our Offshoots website, by the way, that anyone can download if you want to see it. Um, volatile organic compounds, um, TCE, PCE, perchlorate, these are things that dry cleaners. Really good opportunity. Plants can break these things down if, they're, if the root zone can touch them. Most of the petroleum compounds and fuels are actually, can be quite broken down by many plants and their associated microbes. Lots of opportunity there, and as well as some of the pesticides. And then the three outliers for the, the inorganic contaminants are, you can see up there, arsenic, nickel, and selenium. All have really good hyperaccumulators, and they tend to be more bioavailable in the field. So those are the three inorganics where there's some pretty good potential. And the rest of it, honestly, on the bottom of the chart, takes very, very long time frames, and there's not as much potential in the peer-reviewed literature as we see it right now. So um, what I get particularly excited about, and I will show you example projects, is this idea of using a concept called phytohydraulics. And this is a concept that, you know, we have air pollutants in the air, we have it in the stormwater, we have it in the soils, but we also get it in the groundwater. And plumes move, right? And so what happens is when you get pollutants in the groundwater, they can actually travel for great distances and impact um, water quality with a lot of human ingestion, right, when we get into a drinking water wells. So we can think about changing the groundwater plume to actually send the groundwater into the plant. So if we, say, have a contaminant that's moving in, you can see here both uh, the idea of organics and inorganics coming into the plant, we might be able to degrade that organic pollutant like petroleum, Okay, petroleum is the, um, is the number one contaminant of soil in the U.S. And the number one contaminant of groundwater is TCE. And both of these things have been shown to be degraded by plants. And if it's in the groundwater, we could pull those in and actually degrade them while we're holding maybe some of those inorganic contaminants in the root zone or in the leaves of the plant. Okay, what do we typically use for this? You see hybrid poplar used all the time, and there's a reason for that. Hybrid poplars, even in this climate, grow four to six feet a year, right? So when we're talking about that catalyst that we're adding in to the, um, to the planted system, you're sending all those sugars down, creating this explosion of microbiology because the plant is growing so fast. And you're also sucking up tons of water because the plant is growing so fast. So that's why you're producing so much biomass. They tend to be a cross between these different poplars that are up here. Um, often here uh, in, in the Boston area, we can really lean into populous deltoides, cottonwood, because that's right in our wheelhouse, and we can cross it with other things as well for shape and weakness and other sorts of things. So the other thing about poplar is it's a phreatophyte. So what do I mean by that? That means, in the, the Greek um, portion of the word, it means living well. It's a taproot plant, 
right? It goes down and it seeks groundwater. So when you're looking to do a groundwater cleanup, this is a great plant. And this, so very similarly to this plant is the whole Salix family, right? The willow family. That's why we see so much willow and poplar species in phytoremediation because they're doing this phreatophyte thing. There are other opportunities too. The other thing about poplar, you're not meant to read all the little um, text here, but that big bar, this is a measure of transpiration rate, how much water the plant is moving through. A hybrid poplar can go up to 200 gallons a day. That's moving a lot of water, okay? So it's moving a lot more than everything else on this list. So we can, you know, it, it is also going to help with phytohydraulics. So what's happening, right, with those organic contaminants? We're having, we're using this mechanism called rhizodegradation, right? It's actually getting degraded in the root zone by the microbiology that's being associated with the plant. And then we also get phytodegradation. This means we get the contaminant into the plant and there's endophytes living in the leaves, endophytic bacteria, as well as the plant does some of this as well, actually breaks, can break down some organic contaminants in its leaves, okay? We also have a, a term called phytovolatization, which is where the plant, again, gets up that organic contaminant and literally volatilizes it in terms of these light um, VOCs into the air. But then with UV light, it's broken down way better than, getting, than actually drinking you know, something like TCE or one of these other volatile organic compounds. Okay, so now I wanna move on to the fun part, case studies. I had to get the science over, over out of the way because hopefully you guys can use this in your studio projects and your work going forward, okay? So case studies. Starting back in the 1990s, we really saw this explosion of different projects happening um, both with the U.S. Army, um, U.S. Department of Defense, because they had a lot of contaminated sites. And a lot of these, I'm going to talk more about these phytohydraulic projects, because these have really been where the center of phytoremediation has been the most successful. So they did a lot of Air Force bases, including Travis Air Force Base, which had a leak of TCE from an old battery manufacturing facility and they were not able to treat it through a traditional pump and treat system. It was too expensive, it was moving too fast, and they were able to treat it with a planting of eucalyptus, where it actually used the eucalyptus to break down the contaminant. They had control within the plume within three years and um, under a DTEC limit pretty quickly afterwards. So since that time, there are lots of different small companies um, and the reason, you know, we don't see tons of phytoremediation out in the field is that this is a really specific area, okay? Think about if you're an environmental engineer. Do you know anything about plants? Probably not. You know, you want to get to a solution that's going to work, that you're not going to have any liability, right? And so these tend to be people in agriculture schools that get interested in this. And so, for example, um, John Freeman has a company called Intrinsics Environmental. These are his projects around the U.S. right now. They tend to be mostly poplar and willow remediation sites that um, go and do either uh, petroleum or TCE or um, any of the chlorinated solvent re uh, uh, retrofits. And so this is a TCE site you can see in Illinois. This is one I wanted to show you because there was a landscape architect involved. And this is really cool. It's um, a you know big aerospace manufacturing facility that a company that you know very well purchased that it's supposed to be non-disclosed here. So they had some really big contamination issues with vinyl chloride, dichloroethylene, all these chlorinated solvents, okay, TCE. What they did is they had several decades of pump and treat where they were trying to clean this, couldn't get it clean, okay? They have this new company that wants to come in and buy this site and actually start to put its offices there. And so what can they do? They hire Atlas Labs, a landscape architecture practice, out in California. They convince them that they should, instead of just trying to clean the site, they should look at doing phytoremediation at the same time as they're building their project. They got early buy-in by the client by taking them around to John Freeman's other projects, showed them where it was done, a non-design project, and they designed a parking lot, a parking lot that had poplar all throughout the whole thing at very close spacing. They installed six foot high, um, basically whips. They were, they were bare, root, um, bare root whips, so you have dormant cuttings that are cut. And they actually, John Freeman specifically as a scientist has isolated an endophyte in the leaves of these poplars that helps 
improve the degradation of TCE in some of these chlorinated solvents. So he sprays this onto the poplars as they're growing to increase the amount of this, this bacteria in the plant. And then this is the project, okay, designed by a landscape architect in conjunction with a phytoremediation scientist. It is underplanted with this is feather reed grass. It's native out there. They actually put in a whole bunch of other native species in different places. So it's not just a monoculture, right? And this is an active remediation site now um, that they are getting really good results and no longer have to do pump and treat. So very cool collaboration on a bigger scale. So offshoots, we tend to do more of what we call phytolite. So what I mean about that is it, we have a hunch that it's contaminated, but the client may not want to do testing. That happens a lot. Uh, no one wants to find a contamination problem, okay? But we kind of suspect something, and so we take the principles of what we've known and we apply them, okay? So these are projects some, um, that we've done design and installation from our, from our hybrid installation team. So this is a small project in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's a residential project. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see a poplar buffer, okay? And what this is, is there's an industrial area that is up gradient from the groundwater. Now, mind you, stormwater and groundwater don't always flow the same direction. So you have to look up groundwater maps. We look at the Boston Groundwater Trust to look up these maps, okay? We look where the groundwater is going. We know, I get out on the site, I smell petroleum everywhere, okay? It just reeks of petroleum. And we know, I start looking at maps, this was one of the most contaminated half miles along a canal in, in, in Cambridge. So we look where the groundwater's moving, we smell the petroleum, we get the soil tested high in lead, okay? Um, what we decide to do is perpendicular to that groundwater plane, we install a buffer planting, okay? And we also treat the lead by just mounding the soils on site. So what I'm going to show you, this is the poplar buffer first. So this is perpendicular to the groundwater plane. We put this in with bare root plantings, okay? And that was at, this was just at year three. Look how fast those plants are going, all right? Our arborists on site are... They get to prune these babies, right? Because they're going to constantly grow. They're weak wooded. We have to think about how they're going to look long term. But this is them. They create this beautiful backdrop for a new garden that um, the client, by the way, he lives uh, right there. You can see his single family house, the white one. And his son has a sculpture studio right there. And the client tells me, OK, Kate, I only want to spend $20,000. And my son's going to get married here in June. This was November. And I was like, okay, so what are we going to do? So that's why we create this poplar buffer, okay? It's a backdrop for a very pretty purple planting that I'll show you in a minute. But we use texture in Roy Diblick's concept of the no maintenance garden, not N-O, but K-N-O-W. The idea that you, we start to think about less inputs, no irrigation. How do we cut this landscape just once a year? And, c and cover the whole ground plane with the plants because we mounded that contaminated soil that I talked about into these mounds, added compost because you bind lead to soils by having more organic matter and raising the pH. And we do that a lot of the time with compost. So we bind the lead to the soils even more than it might have been before. We leave it on site. We plant these mounds with these pretty things, and we set up this garden that in June, we used a lot of bulbs to create an explosion of color for the wedding, um, which all the pictures were taken here, which was really fun. So, um, you know, we incorporated a lot. The, the plantings really become a backdrop, um, but you've got two types of phytoremediation principles integrated. The other cool thing is this guy is a contractor, or, or was a contractor, and, it, I, you know, with a small budget, he had all of these contracting materials around, you know, these, um, these old granite slabs. Everything here was reused. So even if you go back and you see, like, these horizontal lintels that were used as the curb stops for the cars, we basically pulled everything out of his back lot and tried to reuse it. So it was a lot of fun trying to figure out how we were going to use all those elements. Similarly, another project with, that we worked with UTL, an architecture practice in Boston, they have a, um, it was a, a senior family housing project. I get out there, and uh, halfway through the project, site reeks of petroleum. We look at the plan, oh, there's an auto shop right next door. And the auto shop is, uh, we look where the groundwater's going, it's moving this way, we say, okay, let's put in a phyto buffer on the backside. Client says, 
what do you mean FIDO buffer? I'm like, don't worry about it. So a lot of time we don't even tell what we're going to do because it's just, we only had 18 inches. We stuck these poplar cuttings in 18 inches wide. In some of the plant beds, we have more. We have, um, this is, uh, we put these in as bare root. Offshoots did not install this one, by the way. This was a, a, a bid project. So we did the design and we were acted as a landscape architect. Here's the plants when they went in. These are the trees six years later. Really big. They effectively also, the, the neighborhood was so happy because they screened this bigger now units from their single family houses at the same time. So you get instant screening and we're also very likely cleaning up a lot of the petroleum. Do I know? No, we're not testing. But I've got a pretty good idea we're doing something. This is another project. We're talking about scaling up these kinds of two smaller kind of installations led us to a project we just completed two years ago in Charlestown, right across the street from our office. It's a half acre site in the middle of an industrial area. And the industrial area is the old hood milk bottling plant, okay? And what the client wanted is a, he said, Kate, we want an Instagrammable moment to bring people to the hood, to the hood park because we want to redevelop this into a new mixed use neighborhood. So we went through and we did a really detailed site analysis of looking at the contamination air pollution coming off of 93. It was immediately adjacent to it. We know in up to 200 meters, we have particulate matter air pollution that comes off of highways. Tufts University has tons, done tons of research on this, on asthma rates and also cardiovascular health when you were within 200 meters of a highway. We knew we were in that zone. We also knew that we had very likely contaminated groundwater. All those red dots are contaminated uh, monitoring wells around our area. This is a big industrial area. We map where the groundwater is going by looking at the groundwater trust maps and at um, some of the environmental data from surrounding sites. We know the groundwater is moving towards the highway and then our predominant winter winds are coming from the northwest and, and southwest. So we know that if we put a phyto buffer on the left hand side of this site, we could maybe do something about air and water. So here is the ideas, right? Um, we have this idea of we're going to tap into the groundwater to help uh, remove the contamination. And we're also going to use these plants that we know with stickier, waxier leaves and more stomata, more leaf hairs that tend to attract more particulate air pollution while they have their leaves on them during the summer when people are going to be out there. So the research is really mixed on air pollution. I could do a whole separate lecture on that. I'm not going to right now. But just know it's a little tricky and mixed, but we do know that there are some of these species in some of the papers that do have um, more of these waxy coatings and, are, and do better with particulate matter air pollution. So what do we do? We start to design all these designs where we tilt the plane to try, and I'll show you that in a minute, and we add a phyto buffer along the left-hand side of the site. And this just shows our iteration of form, right? Every, the site analysis was driving the idea, but the form kept changing. What do we get inspired by with form? And I'll show you that in a minute. We started coming up with these hand sketches with this tilted lawn plane, which is uh, number one in the middle. The program we decided was going to be a bike storage facility so that we could have a commuter bike area a pavilion that would take all the bikes from the new area with gender neutral restrooms. And we would sink that underneath our landscape and our landscape would come up and on top of that. And while we were having it rise up, we would create an amphitheater with a flexible platform at the bottom so that they could have spontaneous events that would change all the time. And then it would have this roof deck that would um, be there for people having lunch and that sort of thing and all the people using the neighborhood. So here's it in section. The plants on the top are addressing the air pollution. On top, we, he told me Instagrammable moment. I said, how much budget do you have? So this is the first project that Offshoots actually had a really good budget. Um, and we put five feet of soil on top of a concrete bunker because I'm putting aspens up there, which you know the root system of an aspen, okay? And many, many, many layers of root barrier. Um, so we've got aspens as well as other of these species that I'll talk about in a minute on the top and on the, on the side, we've got our willow and poplars of many different species that we tried, many different cultivars that we tried to uh, be a phryatophyte. So here's the project. It was um, basically um, the, what this view is from looking at, you can see 93 in the background, okay? 
Um, and you can see that air pollution buffer up on the top with the tilted plane. Here's it from the top, right? This is the idea is this really is becoming a catalyst for the neighborhood. What you can see about the move here was really about blocking that highway both visually and physically, right, from the rest of the neighborhood. And um, it really, ha what we're excited about is see all behind how it's all industrial still. The idea is that we were looking to also be able to create a seed source to, sp to spread things that we wanted back into that community with spontaneous vegetation. So there's a couple things here. On the top, this is 90% native plants, okay? And we there were something very specific here. We went as offshoots, we did the installation of this. We went to about five different nurseries for different, um, for different growers to get different um, uh, genetic species for our poplar and for um, several of our other tree species so that we were really moving around uh, and had the, had the genetic variability that we wanted, especially the aspen. Um, and then we also um, did that for a lot of the plant material as well with the idea of we would keep our poplars sterile. We didn't want our non-natives to move, but the plants that we wanted to move, we wanted to create a seed source. So on the right here is showing this plant community of mostly aspen, bayberry, juniperus virginiana. It's basically a coastal ledge. We looked at a plant community of wind whip sites that would take desiccation. And then in the bottom is this hybrid poplar and willow plant community. Here's the seed dispersal diagram. We created all of these kind of Nelly actually created this diagram that is a um, showing how we take these different plant communities and have seed dispersal into, um, into the surrounding areas. And we were highly thinking about aesthetics at the same time, right? We're thinking about what is the color interest? How does it move over time? What are the species? We are thinking about how do we underplant this with pollinator species that were able to create a pollinator pathway? And so you can see a lot of the native plants utilized in a, uh, it's a little blue stem and um, switchgrass matrix underneath. And then we have a few non-natives like Verbena bonariensis coming through just to have some color the first year. Um, but the majority of it is um, it, it, the definition of native being to uh, the CONCOM's de definition in Boston. The other thing we really look at in these systems is trying to figure out what the program is, right, to layer on so many ideas, is that we were looking at all the different things happening in, 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 in um, Charleston and mapping that. And we realized there was nothing that happened on Mother's Day. So we did add in this whole explosion, basically, of 30,000 bulbs to draw people here. So um, we have had a lot, of, a lot of bulbs that are there, and it's been really beautiful. And then this is our installation team putting it in. So everyone um, was trained, harness trained, to be working on a roof. We came up there and brought in a lot of big trees. Um, we had six different soil mixes. So my roof um, plantings, right, where, I do, where I'm having my meadow systems, are very, very infertile with a high pH for a little blue stem because I don't want weed pressure, right? And then so different than my wet thicket on the bottom, which is high organic and low pH. So we're really thinking about the soil design at the same time. Here's us craning in our plants. Uh, this is me out in the field. Most of the time when I'm creating a plant herbaceous plant community, we actually will just do percentages of what the plants are. And I lay, we don't even do a planting plan of where they all go because I'm going to move it all anyways when I get out there. <laughs> so this is us doing the swaths when we're out there with the plant communities. It's all plugs that we put in. No one gallon plants. We want them to, to exist as a community. Thinking about the microbiome underneath too. Um, and uh, these are my guys being really unhappy that we're putting in 30,000 bulbs after we installed the plugs in the spring. Not happy, <laughs> so, but it's all good. We did it. The other thing this landscape does is it had clean soil underneath that elevated platform. So that's where we put in cisterns to pre-plan for the big high rise that would likely go in next door, that we would then take the stormwater, be able to infiltrate all of the stormwater into a clean chunk of the site. The other thing that happens is in the foreground here, there's a bioswale that treats all of the, the stormwater runoff from the site itself too. And that's a whole different soil mix because I'm having low fertility, no mulch, no compost because I don't want it to leach any kind of nutrients. This is the bioswale on the front side. The fun thing about these, that when you do this work in installation and design, you can always try things that you don't know if they're going to work. 
So for, the, for this one, we tried a plant called Mirica Gale, right? Mirica Gale is a wetland plant that I didn't know if it would live in dry uh, rain garden soils. It's doing awesome out there, but it was safe to fail, right? Because we know that we're doing the management going on, and we can go out there and change it, and it's not going to be a big deal. The form I mentioned to you, what were we inspired by? We created all those different things. Uh, all those different forms. We looked at the hood milk bottle that was originally produced. Hood, mi hood milk you used to get like your your milk in a ladle from the milkman, and hood was the first one to deliver milk in a it's an individual bottle. And we said, okay, that's really cool. Let's take the double radius of this hood milk bottle and use that to inform our curves on our benches and our our plan view drawing of the boomerang sketch um, of the these boomeranged corners. And so we use that inspiration to create these precast concrete forms that, that morphed from a bench to a curb to a stair um, that surrounded these loose plantings with a very finished detail that makes many of these loose plantings more acceptable to people. Because we have an installation practice, we love doing mock-ups. We were doing these little things to see how big it was. Um, we were testing the size of the monumental stairs. It was, it's really fun with that part of it and, um, and had a lot of fun with the lighting as well. But, you know, in the end, really, it becomes a place for people. And this is kind of looking backwards at the hood milk stack um, and is really starting to become, I think, uh, starting a generator of activity of this area. All right, so now I just want to talk about a couple other projects that are um, about um, just some quick other examples of a few other things that we've been doing in water um, and also in, um, in micro-remediation. So Charles River watershed, right? Um, many of you know the Charles River went from a D water quality to about um, a, an A minus in 2013, but then went back down to a B plus because of phosphorus, right? We know stormwater and atmospheric deposition is putting a lot of nitrogen and especially phosphorus in our freshwater waterways. And so we worked on the Longfellow Bridge Project as well as we just completed a 16-mile vegetation master plan a couple years ago for DCR to think about what can we do along the Charles to, for this, uh, this phosphorus problem. So what we did at the Longfellow Bridge is that um, Mass Department of Transportation needed to treat the stormwater that had a lot of phosphorus going into the Charles. And so what they said is, we're going to give you this little peanut to put your stormwater into you, and you figure out how to clean it. So um, what we did is we designed a gravel wetland, and the gravel wetland is very interesting because it keeps all the water subsurface, okay? So you don't have to worry about mosquitoes and all these other things people worry about with wetlands, and it sends it through a gravel media that we then sorb the phosphorus out of the attract it on, into the plant roots and into the organic media to take it out of the water before it goes on. Usually you don't use gravel wetlands for phosphorus. In this case, we did modeling that we knew that we could meet the minimums. So here's the kind of project. We're kind of flying in over Boston and we're flying into our site on the Charles River. Here's the peanut. We did one on both sides, one on the Boston and Cambridge side. It first flows into a sediment forebay, then goes into a second cell underground and the third cell underground and the sediment forebay, just getting sediment out of the water, if you let the sediment settle, often re removes up more than 50% of the pollutants. You've got to get the sediment out. It's really important, and you can't remobilize it. So you have to clean the sediment out of the forebay afterwards. Otherwise, you have another storm, and it just mobilizes it right through the system. So sediment forebay, what we call pretreatment, and then the rest in the cells. We design a... Um, DCR's definition of native is to the county. Um, so we design a native planting to the county. That is my, my biggest design idea was that we didn't want it higher than 36 inches because we don't want it to look messy long term. And that also that it was going to be yellow and purple and white and have kind of this consistent theme. This is the other side of the river, the Boston one. You can see the sediment forebay on the left going into the two gravel cells. Um, and this one um, aesthetically is more successful than one on the Cambridge side. They have two very different plant palettes. This one I used, um, there are fewer species, okay? So I used about 60 different species because the research we were looking at is the greater species diversity, the better phosphorus removal because of a lot of the microbial connections going on in the soil and the breakdown, that you're, uh, the, um, breakdown of the organic matter that you're getting in the plants. 
On the Boston side, we used less species diversity, but over time, it's looked cleaner and looks, looks I think, has perceived, been perceived better from the public. We have a lot of swamp milkweed in it. We see a ton of monarchs, which we're super excited about, and other pollinators. This is the Cambridge side. It looks weedy. It's, got a, it's mostly native, but do people like the way that Biden's looks, an annual native that we let go because it's native? Not really. I thought that these kind of clean edges of the, of, the, of the stone would be really well received. People don't like the way it looks. But they like the Cambridge one that's less species and looks like big, big, big streaks. So I think it's something that we, you know, we have to challenge what is acceptable aesthetically. Um, and and I, I think it's great to have these two different kind of ways that we planted it to compare um, what they're doing. But in the end, the biggest thing you have to know about phosphorus, you have to, where this you see here is when we cut it down in November, you have to cut down the plants because the plants are going to return the phosphorus when they decompose right down into the water supply. You've got to remove the plants from the site, okay? It's a big portion of it. So um, that's something to, especially in a gravel wetland. Okay, and then lastly, what I wanted to show you in terms of that research, right? We're constantly doing new research. We were recently hired a year ago by Mass Department of Transportation to do a project on researching mycofiltration. Could we add um, fungi, right, that produce mushrooms or don't produce mushrooms to our stormwater best management practices to actually improve nitrogen and phosphorus and biological contaminants? We did this research project that took about a year and a half. We just presented the findings. This is all going to be out and available in a final report in about two months. It's being reviewed right now by Federal Highway. But what we all know, right, is these roadways put, produce a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus and biological contaminants like E. coli. We looked at literature review, peer-reviewed papers. We did interviews with experts in this area. We looked at field studies and lab studies that were done, um, both uh, here, mostly out on the West Coast, okay? That's where most of the work has been done. And what we found out is really the saprophytic fungi, the ones that are the decomposers, as well as our mycorrhizal fungi, the plant partners, are the two that people are basically looking at for this additional degradation. But the findings of the study is truly the quick and dirty is that there is a dearth of peer-reviewed literature on this subject. Everyone is jammed up about it and wants to start putting fungi in, and the peer-reviewed literature is not there to support it. It is not there to roll it out. DOT wanted us to develop a set of specs and start doing this. Although it looks good, it looks like we're headed in that direction, that we're going to have increased phosphorus uptake. We're really worried about the anecdotal studies, the human errors and lack of information, Short study durations, many of these are like a week-long study. And they're also not looking at the nativity of the species. Like, are we, are we bringing in the next Japanese knotweed but a fungi, right? Because we're not looking at, we're starting to bring other generalists into these systems. And we don't know how they affect it long-term in the landscape. The projects are mostly all on the West Coast, the ones that have been done. So, the, right, different water, right? Different water, different, different, so we can't really apply it. What we did is we identified six main types where we think that we could, six main practices where we could inoculate with fungi possibly. And we've identified three that we think the mycoblanket, the filter tube, and bioretention that we think could do a lot more. And we have potential new partners to start to test some of these things. With BU, we have a mycologist. I would love to find out if there's a mycologist in UMass that is interested in this. So hopefully this gets out to people and we can find out. We would love to work with UMass. We have a partner at the UH Stormwater Center, um, David Hibbett at Clark University, um, and Jenny Batnagar, she's at BU. So we're really excited about the next phase of testing here, you know, before we roll anything out. Very lastly, putting all these things together, what I love is when we have an offshoots project that you start to bring all your little nuggets of information and start to apply them. This is a North Shore biotech campus um, that it was really important in COVID, testing for the different variants that were coming in. They're a B corporation, right? Um, they have an um, environmental mission, and they have a ton of bluegrass lawns surrounding their buildings. But what's so cool is that they have a living machine down in the bottom right-hand corner that processes all their wastewater right on site. And they are really interested in making it a more ecological landscape. So they hired offshoots. We created a ecological master plan that changes all of the plantings around the buildings to be more productive. And what we mean is water cleansing. We mean 
Um, it is, we looked at the ecosystems and did surveys of the vegetation that was all around the site. We brought that in. We're creating meadows with Larry Wiener Associates very tightly to, um, to, do, to do native meadows that support pollinators. And we're using a restoration planting approach to create these woodlands that come in from the edges and start to restore the site. This is our installation team out there. And what I want to show is like the research really feeds into each other. We highly designed the soils, but of course we weren't responsible for putting in the soils. Not so good. We start doing the research on mycoremediation and all of this important work on mycofiltration and using um, our mycorrhizal fungi to connect the root systems of the plants. And so we start taking reference soils, not compost, because compost is often biologically doesn't have as much activity because you've been heating it to 300 degrees and you kill a lot of the biological activity in the soil. So what we do is we, with our mycologists that we were working with, they say take small amounts of reference soil, meaning we went into our oak hickory woodland that we were trying to repeat and we went and took reference soils and brewed them and also put small amounts of reference soils in the holes to be able to start to hopefully create these networks of mycorrhizal fungi that might help breed the plants. That being said, we get really excited about our work. Um, we have a great team, and I put pictures up of the people here because this is like my shout out to you guys, is that at my last time lecturing here seven years ago, I met Nellie, who is now an employee at Offshoots. Um, and, you know, we have design inter internships at Offshoots. We also have construction internships with Offshoots that we love Stockbridge students. And then I also just seriously wanted to mention my dad's garden center. My dad is 77. He is retiring this year. I have been looking for three years to find someone to help me run an ecological new garden center where you go buy your alternative to the bluegrass lawn, you buy your pollinator planting, you, die, you, you buy your planting design by Nellie and our staff that's all beautiful and put together, phytoremediation plants, native willows that you can't get anywhere, but I can't find the right person. So we would love someone. So if you tell your friends, contact me if you are interested in an ecological garden center in Paxton, Massachusetts, basically right by Worcester. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much and hope we all get something out of phytoremediation today.